You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 23, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Larry Rosen, a professor and past chair of the psychology department at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and a specialist in multitasking, social networking, generational differences, parenting, child and adolescent development, and educational psychology, and an expert in the psychology of technology. Dr. Rosen's books include Eye Disorder, Understanding Our Obsession with Technology and Overcoming Its Hold on Us, and Rewired, Understanding the Eye Generation and the Way They Learn. We're extremely pleased to welcome Dr. Larry Rosen to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In the upcoming interview that you're about to hear with Dr. Larry Rosen, You'll hear Dr. Rosen talk about the transition over time from when people had what he called technophobia, which was largely a fear of technology that stemmed from unfamiliarity with computers and other devices, to what he called techno stress, which was the stress that resulted from using technology, even by people who were comfortable and familiar with it, to a much wider variety of psychological consequences of technology use. And in this tip on using technology mindfully and bringing mindfulness to technology, I'd like to ask you to draw your attention today or this week to any feelings of fear or stress or anxiety, trepidation that you might have in connection with your smartphone and other devices. Many of us experience a lot of positive emotions in connection with our technology use. We have a lot of happiness and joy and excitement. We might see and hear and read things that make us laugh or feel connection with other people. Uh, And we may also feel anticipation of those positive feelings before using technology or while we're away from it. We also, many of us, myself included, feel a variety of negative feelings like fear, anxiety, uh, fear that we are missing out. What's been called FOMO, fear of missing out when we're not at our devices. The fear that there might be something there that we're not seeing, uh, waiting for us that a conversation perhaps that other people are engaged in, some piece of news that we're missing out and falling behind on. We might, um, while using technology, gain an increasing sense of anxiety from all of the things we feel we need to do with it, respond to messages or do work that we see waiting for us while looking at our smartphone screen or sitting down at our desktop computer. So what I'd like to suggest is for this exercise, which you could engage in right now or later today, or perhaps make it a practice for the next week, is merely to notice any of those feelings. And I would ask that you focus specifically on these feelings like fear and anxiety, merely to pay particular attention to them for a while. And Dr. Rosen is a psychologist and a teacher. He'll talk a lot about the psychological effects, how to understand them, the science behind them. For this exercise, though, which is a mindfulness exercise, I would ask you to try your best merely to notice any of these feelings. So You might try it this way by picking up your smartphone, going to an app like Facebook or your email or text messages that you know is likely to cause you some amount of anxiety and launch it. And then without doing anything further, just look at the home screen of the app, whatever appears, and pay attention to any feelings, particularly 
of fear, anxiety, or stress that arise and don't take any action. That's the mindfulness exercise. To focus on the feeling and merely notice it without trying to analyze the feeling, without trying to change it or take any action. And then what I'd ask that you do is, as you practice this, maybe throughout the day, whenever you engage with your phone, or perhaps you set aside some time once a day for a week, see how that repeated noticing without doing anything affects you. See if there are any effects, any insights, any changes in your feelings over time. And as we know from mindfulness practice generally, uh, sometimes if there are any effects of noticing, it can take quite a while. I wouldn't suggest that you expect practicing noticing of fear or anxiety to have any kind of short-term immediate impact, but you may find that it does over time. So that's my suggestion for noticing negative feelings that may arise in you when you use technology. And now for a much broader discussion of the psychology of technology and its long history from someone who has studied and written and spoken about it over many decades, I invite you to listen to my interview with Dr. Larry Rosen. Hi, Dr. Rosen, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks for having me. You've been studying and writing about the psychology of technology for a very long time. Your book, Technostress, was written in 1997, which is really ancient history and technological time. And I'm wondering if we could start off by talking about, as a psychologist, what first attracted your professional and personal interest in the interaction between technology and psychology? That's an interesting question because uh, I, I started studying this in 1984, um, if you can believe it. And in, in 1984, a colleague and I were going to teach a class, team teach a class on statistics. And we decided we were going to have some fun with the students and let them do, instead of teaching them all the rigorous math behind the statistics, we were just going to teach them how to do it on a computer and let them then learn from the printouts what it all meant rather than learning from the math. So the interesting thing was the first day we took the students, about 30 students, over to the computer center. At that point, 1984, all we had were um, punch card systems. Sure. I'm sure most of the listeners have no idea what a punch card is. (laughs) Um, but they were these old old cards that uh, you would type and it would punch holes in them and then you would feed them into a into a computer but you wouldn't feed them personally you'd have to give them to somebody to do that and because obviously the computers were very serious and behind glass walls and and these were serious people who wore pocket protectors and white lab coats and um, the second day of class there were only 15 students there And luckily, we knew the students. We have had a small department back in those days. So we contacted the students and asked them why they were not going to take the class. And to a one, the answer was because we're afraid of the computer. Wow. And we had never thought about that. I mean, I was kind of raised by two parents. One who was a mathematician, a high school math teacher. The other was an accountant. So numbers were were normal to me. And they used to take me to the UCLA open house every year where I would go to the computer center immediately and print out pictures of Mickey Mouse on sprocket feed printers and have a ball looking at all the the new technology, which seems funny now. Um, And um, so we decided to do some searching. And again, in those days, there was no internet or what what the, what there was of the internet doesn't look anything like the internet. But we found that there were was a search system that you could use up at Stanford University. So we got on a modem. And by modem, what I mean was this little typewriter thing that had two um, soft um, pads, basically, that you put your phone into, a little coupler, and it made lots of noise. And you typed on a typewriter and you asked it questions. So we didn't really know what to ask. So we started asking about fear of computers and nothing came up and anxiety about computers, nothing came up. 
And we tried, decided just to throw a term out called computer phobia. Didn't know what it was going to do. And all of a sudden, a few articles came out. Mm. And we realized that people had started to investigate this and that it, nobody had really done any research. So we decided to, to do research over the next um, about half a decade. We studied computer phobia in school teachers and in business people, um, pretty much any group we could find. Um, we did an international study with 34 other countries and looked at their levels of computer phobia until we realized that there was no such thing as computer phobia anymore. And people weren't really afraid of the computer. It was a more broad fear of technology in general. Um, and we started with the concept of technophobia. And then by the time the mid 90s rolled out, we were calling it techno stress because we realized it wasn't a necessarily a phobia. We were, people weren't afraid. It just stressed them out to think about letting this device do things for them. So it was a long haul from there. Um, and since those years back in the late 90s, I've been studying something that I wouldn't call techno stress. I wouldn't call technophobia. I wouldn't call computer phobia. What I would just call it is the psychology of technology. Well, since you saw the reaction that people had to technology change in that time, what are the most prominent features now of people's psychology that relates to their interactions with technology? Oh my goodness, that's such a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, much of what we see and what we study is looking at what aspects of technology seem to impact on the way people see and use the world. And um, in, in my mind, if we look at the world and how things have gone, um, really the last 10 years have been um, a seen a dramatic shift in the way um, we all view the world through um, our little tiny boxes that we carry with us all the time. Um, Probably that shift was caused by what I would say are three major game changers. Um, the first was already there, and that was the World Wide Web, basically allowing people the luxury of being able to search for any information at any date, any time, anywhere. Um, but the other two kind of tumbled in back 10 years ago. The first was the iPhone, which basically allowed us to carry our computer with us everywhere we go. And, and obviously this is now morphed from the iPhone to smartphones in general, but it's the same concept. Um, I remember pre-iPhone getting my first BlackBerry and feeling like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can carry this with me. I can get my email whenever I want. I can chat with people. Oh, this is fantastic. And then the third game changer turned out to be probably the most important one, and that is social media. And the reason this was a game changer is because prior to, to some of the early social media sites like Friendster and MySpace, um, our communication was primarily one-to-one. -one. I could email someone. I could chat with someone. Um, if you were gaming, you could often chat with multiple people, but it was very difficult to do and very buggy. And all of a sudden with social media, now you were talking one to many. And so you had a, an increasingly larger audience listening to you all the time. And what we've seen over that time is people basically getting um, sucked into that world where they're spending inordinate, amount, inordinate amounts of time communicating and communicating through a variety of sources, um, the obvious email, text messages, um, but then social media. And this is what we're finding consumes most people's time online. And it makes sense because as humans, our goal is to connect with people. That's what we do as humans. We, we thrive on it. If we don't connect with people, we have mental problems and, and serious issues. And so we are now, because of these three game changers, spending an incredible amount of time on these devices, mostly communicating with the world. 
So you said that people are communicating with each other on social media because that is what we do. Uh, but you point to the very large amount of time that people are spending doing it. What is the problem then from a psychological point of view when people do what is natural in a sense, but do it too much? Well, there's two problems. Um, one, um, you're spending your day with your face down um, looking at a screen. And so you're not um, experiencing the world as it is. Um, there is a phrase out there um, about picture taking that people, kids particularly say, pics or it didn't happen. <laughs> Meaning that whatever happens to you during the day, if you don't take a picture, it doesn't exist. And so you see people incessantly looking at the world through a little square lens or in this case, rectangular now, lens, rather than experiencing the world through their eyes. Um, and, and that's a major change. I mean, it sounds like a pretty radical shift in the sense, if I'm understanding it, that it's almost that people's belief about what's real or isn't is dependent on whether they've experienced through technology. And it goes hand in hand with um, social media because... Once you've, you've seen it through that lens, then there's one more step, which is to post it for everybody to see and then sit back and wait for likes, comments, reposts, whatever. Um, and we've really become dependent on our sense of self, I think, and on our mental health by what we see in our social media feed, how people treat us. And and you can see this really clearly on your birthday because you know that everybody on Facebook or on any, probably on any system has been informed that today is Larry Rosen's birthday. And so on that day, I start getting floods of happy birthday messages on Facebook. And they all sort of sound the same. Happy birthday, Dr. Rosen. Have a great B, B day. Um, enjoy. They're all the same, but each one as it comes in gives me a little rush, gives me a little pleasurable feeling, probably coming from um, a chemical in the brain called dopamine, which we've learned to associate with pleasure. So we, we have these systems out there that can give us pleasure. The problem is, is that they can also give us pain. And this is the conundrum because we find um, cyberbullying taking place on social media. Um, we find shunning taking place on social media. Um, and, and we find disappointment taking place. And the disappointment is often called social comparison, where your life doesn't seem nearly as nice as the lives of all of your social media friends which is a little ludicrous because you know that social media friends don't wake up in the morning and post something, oh, it's going to be a terrible day. I feel awful. Um, they mostly post positive things and they post lots of pictures about events that they went to that you weren't invited to. And they post pictures of their wonderful vacations and the beautiful sunsets that they see. And somehow your life then starts to dim in relationship to the, to the postings. And then the other, the other area that concerns me is that if you are spending all of your time getting your, what we call in psychology, social capital from people who are at a distance, many of whom you know personally, but many of whom you don't know personally, then what is happening to our ability to communicate face to face? Are we going to lose that ability? Are we going to choose to go online and get a lot of adulation from people we know at a distance and we don't know at a distance? Or are we going to wait and get our adulation from people who are close to us? And I think that this is particularly difficult when you start talking about young kids um, because part of what you see is they're learning to communicate electronically pretty much at the same time they're learning the nuances of communication face-to-face. -face. And it's just a whole lot easier to communicate electronically. And so part of what we're starting to see is that the young kids are losing their ability to 
understand the nuances, the, the pragmatics of communication, and are not ending up understanding nonverbal behavior, um, not understanding sarcasm, not understanding the kinds of normal things that you would learn growing up without um, this constant time spent on social media. So we're really in kind of a crux of, of, of a place here. Um, I look at it like a pendulum and that swings usually all the way to, to a place that it then starts backtracking. And I don't think we're there yet. I don't think it's this pendulum has started backtracking yet. Um, and I think part of it is because we're so invested in our virtual connections. There's a lot to unpack in what you just said. One of the things that struck me is that um, you really pointed out how this does differ from how people have always compared themselves socially. You know, we used to talk about uh, keeping up with the Joneses. People have always looked at their neighbors or friends. But you said that what's different is that people now have the ability to do this kind of comparison with many more people who they don't know, who are distant from them. And there's, you know, a pressure or inclination to do that more frequently, if I'm understanding you correctly. I think that's true. Um, I think it's just easier. Uh, we live in a world of alerts and notifications, and most people keep them on all the time. So there's little numbers telling them that somebody said something about them on Facebook or commented on Facebook. Um, there's an Instagram follow or a Twitter post or something. We're constantly getting reminders of these people out there. And those reminders are really hard to ignore. It's, it's hard to put yourself in a position where you see that little red number above Facebook telling you how many messages you've missed and not respond to it and not respond to it viscerally, um, which is really now what we're starting to study is looking at what's going on inside your body that is causing these issues that we're finding. And the issues are um, many. Um, they're psychological. Uh, there's just a, a ton of research out of our lab and many other labs talking about the, the sort of negative impact that social media and technology in general has on your psychological health, on your physical health. Um, and then there's also the fact that we, with all of these notifications, we live in a world of distraction, a world where we may very well um, have a goal in mind that we're trying to accomplish, but that goal ends up getting set aside often by other intrusions, um, mostly connections, mostly people wanting to talk to you or wanting to, to connect with you. And so we're finding it more and more difficult to fulfill our goals. Um, they take longer to do because we keep getting distracted. And there's some evidence that shows that we don't process them as deeply anymore. So there's people studying concepts of creativity, um, boredom, those kind of concepts that get in the way of processing um, our world and our thoughts, both inner world and outer world, um, in, in a deep fashion. And that's part of what makes us human, is that we're able to take ideas and let our brain kind of run free and connect ideas together in unique ways that then are helpful to us, either emotionally helpful, physically helpful, mentally helpful, it doesn't matter. But we need that. We can't just process things at a light level, at a very, um, very minimal level and expect to have a fulfilling day, a fulfilling time. I've certainly experienced, I think many people have experienced being distracted by technology. I wonder, are you saying that the research is showing that we are not just getting distracted by notifications, but that the ongoing interaction with technology actually keeps us from thinking more deeply or staying focused in those times when we're not using technology? Is it uh, changing our brains? Well, that's two questions. So the first half of the question is um, 
the research uh, shows that about half the time we get distracted by an alert or notification, but the other half of the time we get distracted by no alert or notification, meaning the only place it can come from is our brain. And so what we're talking about is a constant stream of either external interruptions or internal interruptions. And we spend a lot of time talking about both of those in our work, but I'm much more interested in what's going on inside your head that's making you stop, look at your phone. I, for example, I just turned my phone upside down because I got two text messages and two <laughs> emails while I was talking to you. And the tendency, even though I know better than this, I, I'm not a young person. I'm 60, almost 68 years old. Uh, I know better than this, yet I find it difficult to help myself. And then while my phone is upside down, my brain is now going, hmm, I wonder if any emails came in that you, that you really need to pay attention to. And what that is, is a chemical system in your brain that has a slew of chemicals that we have interpreted over our lifetime as anxiety provoking. So for example, things like cortisol, um, adrenaline, chemicals like that. And what we're seeing happen um, in a variety of situations is that the more that you feel like this anxiety creeps up on you, the more you feel the need to get rid of the anxiety. And the anxiety tends to be not just free-floating anxiety, but it tends to be anxiety about communication, checking in, um, people will say, if I watch them using their phone for no reason, I'll say, what are you doing? They say, well, I'm just checking it into Facebook and Instagram real quick, uh, looking to see if I got any snaps, whatever. What drove that, we think, is anxiety. And we think that the more anxious you get about feeling that you're missing out on something, some people call it FOMO, fear of missing out. I don't like the term because it's not a fear yet, it's an anxiety might be a fear someday, but it's, right now it's a level of anxiety. But the more you feel that anxiety about missing out, the more you feel the need to check in. So your brain is driving you to check in to reduce the anxiety. So you check in, reduce the anxiety, but then it starts to build again because people are posting all the time on these social media sites and sending you tons of emails and texts and, and snaps and all sorts of things. And so the bottom line is you find yourself checking in more and more often. Um, I had my students for the last two years put an app on their phone that monitored the number of times they unlocked their phone each day and the number of minutes that it remained unlocked. And two years ago, so uh, spring of 2016, my students unlocked their phone um, 56 times a day for 220 minutes. That's about four minutes per unlock, and it's about every 15 minutes of waking hours that you unlock your phone. So you imagine you go 15 minutes, you unlock your phone, you're on it for about four minutes, um, and then you lock your phone back up again, and then 10 minutes later, you unlock it again, and again, and again, all day long. Last year, so spring 2017, we did it again, and found that Again, these students, by the way, are, are not young. They're they're in our on our campus. Our students are young adults. The average age is in the in the mid twenties, usually around twenty five. So these are not eighteen, nineteen year olds. These are these are young adults. Many of them, probably most of them, married and in the working world at the same time, and going to school full time. So they're very serious about it too. They unlock their phones fifty times less than the fifty six but for 262 minutes. And if you do the math, that's about five minutes per time that they unlock their phone. What do we think is happening and why is it going up so much? Well, in the last couple of years, we've seen the rise of different social media sites. And in fact, we asked students about what social media sites they use. And 80% of them had active accounts on four social media sites. One should be obvious, that's Facebook. One is much less obvious, and that is YouTube, although they spend a lot of time on YouTube, and it is a social media site now. The other two are brand new. One is Instagram, which is very young, and the other is Snapchat. 
80% of the students had an account, an active account that they used daily on those sites. So if you've got four of those sites that you're checking into, and in fact, the average number of site, meet social media sites was just shy of six. So if you're checking in on three, four, five, six social media sites, that's a lot to do every 15 minutes. Wow. Um, and do you have any research that shows what changes occur within an individual person over time? It sounds like you could perhaps infer some of that from this, but I'm wondering, you know, does use of the technology within an individual person create more anxiety, which perhaps drives more use of the technology and creates that kind of a feedback loop? Right. I think that's what you described is exactly what's happening is it, it is a feedback loop and it is increasing. Um, most of our studies, I mean, I would really love to do that study and use the same people from year to year and maybe You've just given me another research project that'll take me 10 years to do, <laughs> but, but it would be interesting to track that over time. And, and there are apps that will tell you what people are doing online. We've stayed away from them because it's, it's, uh, I think an invasion of privacy, um, to, to see what students are doing. But, um, I do think that, that it gets worse and worse. And by worse and worse, I mean that the, the increase in anxiety about feeling like you're not checking in often enough is getting more pronounced. Um, one of the things that we are doing right now is we've created um, um, a paper and pencil measure that we've used now for, um, I believe, four plus years. And we've given it to large numbers of students um, and other people over the years. And we're now looking and tracking the, that use over time. And we'll be doing this over probably another four or five years to see how that is changing. Um, what we're starting to see is that in some areas, and in particular the areas that have to do with connection, the changes are pretty radical. Although interesting enough, I was just looking at the data, the, the, the amount of texting has increased steadily, but the amount of talking on the phone has decreased steadily, which is also a bit troubling to me because. Um, some of our work shows that talking on the phone is helpful when you're struggling with symptoms of psychiatric disorders. But those people who talk on the phone more tend to have more people to bounce things off of and tend to have fewer symptoms. Um, so it is a little troubling to me that we're using the phone less as a phone and more as a connection device virtually. And I know you've talked already about being particularly concerned about the impact on young people. Now, I wonder if you could talk about differences between, let's say, people who were born into the internet age, the age of the iPhone, people who had some amount of formative time before becoming users of that technology, and perhaps also older people. I mean, this is just purely anecdotal from my own life. I have known some people who are, let's say, in their 50s or older before they first started using a smartphone. And I've seen many of them become almost addicted to the technology, which seems to be contrary to the common belief that it's just young people who become hooked on it. Right. It is, it is no longer young people. Um, that is a fallacy of reasoning. Um, it is everyone. And certainly there are pockets of people at all ages that don't spend a lot of time and don't get sucked into that world. But all you have to do is be an ob ob observer of people to realize that when you walk around, there are old people with their faces down looking into that phone just as much as there are young people. Um, the good news, I think, is for the older people, people who have grown up um, without the smartphone as the primary focus of their world. And for that, I would call the that groups either the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, even what people call the net generation. Um, th those people born up through, say, the, the 80s um, probably have already had time to develop their communication skills without technology. And so there is some hope that even though they're immersed in the technology, their communication skills are still there. And you see a lot of older people who will text, for example, and write full sentences. 
Um, they'll put periods at the end. They'll put capitals at the beginning. They'll understand the kind of niceties of communication. They'll say thank you on text messages. They'll 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 write text messages and they'll write posts on social media as though they were talking to someone or sending someone um, that's next to them a message. I think you've just outed me because that describes how I text. <laughs> well, and I, I'm somewhere in between. I mean, sometimes I. I do that, but oftentimes I find myself slipping into the kind of emoji shortcut um, textism world. Um, and part of that is just because this is the world we live in. People communicate with you that way, and so you communicate back to them that way. Uh, it's it's a very fascinating world to live in right now, and I think we're at a real transition point um, in terms of our connections with human beings. And I, I always try to be optimistic about this stuff. I try to believe that sanity will prevail and that people will recognize that perhaps being on your phone for 262 minutes a day is not good for you in, a, in the long run and that moderation is going to be better. Um, having said that, um, there are lots of books out there that try to find ways to get you to do it in moderation. I just read one about taking a 30 day fast. And I talked to somebody who takes a fast on the Sabbath. Um, she doesn't use her phone all day. Um, people go up to the mountains for retreats, um, and not use their technology. Um, that's fine and dandy, but that's not getting at the root of the problem. The root of the problem is, is that when you come down the hill from the mountains where you couldn't use your technology, you now have so many posts on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, whatever, that you're again overwhelmed. And that gives a negative impact on your, your mental and psychological and even physical health. Well, it's a good time for us to transition. You said you think we're at a transitional stage of humanity, perhaps. You know, maybe we can transition to talking about some of the hopefulness uh, and the place for optimism here. You know, what opportunities do you see for either individuals or families or institutions to try to turn back to a more balanced way of communicating using technology and interacting with technology? And, and uh, this is my goal in everything I do, everything I write, everything I say when I speak is geared toward, okay, here's the reality. Now, what can you do? Um, in, the, in the most recent book I wrote, The Distracted Mind, I wrote it with a neuroscientist, Dr. Adam Ghazali. And at the end of the book, he wrote a chapter that basically said, now that we know what is going on in your brain and in your body, what does neuroscience tell us will help keep you sane, help keep protect your humanware, basically, rather than your software and your hardware? And then I wrote a chapter after that on what we've learned psychologically can protect yourself. So the interesting part is on from the neuroscience point of view, there is a lot of research going on out there that will tell you what kind of things you can do to make yourself better. Um, for example, exercise is a really has a really positive effect on your body and your biochemistry, and there's lots of evidence showing that. Um, nature has a lot of positive effects on your brain and your biochemistry. Just ten minutes of exercise, just ten minutes of going out into nature, calms your brain, puts it back into a better state that allows you then to maybe have a better shot at not being so distracted. Um, and then there's lots, of other, there's lots of other things you can do um, from a behavioral point of view. And I am a strict behaviorist. I believe in positive reinforcement and punishment as two of the major tools in our arsenal. And what you can do from that angle is you can choose to make decisions that, that will help you stay focused. So one of the things that I suggest highly is that you start weaning yourself off of the constant checking in and that you start by setting an alarm on your phone for, say, 15 minutes, turning your phone upside down, putting it right in front of your face as a reminder. Um, 
And when the alarm goes off in 15 minutes, let yourself check your email, let yourself check your social media, whatever you want for a minute, two minutes, whatever you decide, but program that in. I mean, literally set an alarm, say for two minutes. And when your two minutes is done, close all the windows that are connection windows. So all your email, all your social media, because otherwise you're going to see those little numbers right now. My Facebook has three. That means there's three messages I've missed. And my Twitter feed has a star, which means I've missed hundreds. Um, my email has a number three. So if those are staring me in the face, I'm not going to be able to focus. So you close all those. And then when the alarm goes off in 15 minutes, you check them again. Eventually that gets comfortable, at which point you, you change the 15 minutes to 20 or 25 or 30. And there are people who also just say, start by setting an alarm for 30 minutes and don't let yourself check in except every 30 minutes. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of strategies that you can use. And one that I think is really interesting, and this, this actually comes from uh, my experience with meditation as well as, as Adam's, is there's, there's a lot of evidence that shows that, that mindful meditation um, is an excellent way to calm the brain. And in particular, to calm the brain that is overloaded by technology. And so there's some strong research coming out using mindful meditation with kids all the way down to kindergarten level um, and with people all the way up to older adults to help you kind of take your brain and put it back into a nice restful state. Um, I would argue that you're probably being much more in the present at that point. And letting that restful state then guide your brain and your activities. Um, it, I suspect there will be lots more evidence coming out over the next few years. Um, but my guess is it's going to turn out to be one of those very simple things to do. Basically, you learn a short course of mindful meditation. You learn how to do a five to 10 minute mindful meditation, put yourself back in the present. And then when you get back into your technology use, then it will make more sense to you to not be so obsessed with it. One of the things, by the way, that I've been doing lately for myself personally is every couple hours on my iPhone, I double tap and look at all the apps that are open in the background. And I'm always flabbergasted how many there are. And many of them I don't remember opening. Um, so a lot of this is is mindless that we're opening these things. And why did I open the weather app? I don't remember. Maybe some, there was some reason. So I will during the day, go and do that and periodically just flip away all of the apps that are open in the back background. And it's like giving me a, a fresh start <laughs> and then mindfully pay more attention to when I open an app. My ultimate goal is to try to see if I can get fewer and fewer open, meaning that I was less and less distracted. I really like the suggestions because, um, you know, they complement each other. There's, of course, using mindfulness meditation to be able to be more present more of the time. But your suggestion about um, setting the alarm or the timer is one which I've used that as well. I use it pretty frequently. And I think of it as a way to not necessarily have to rely on my conscious presence every moment. I know I can rely on the timer letting me know when it's time or when I'm allowed to be mindless a little bit. <laughs> I think that's a good good view, to be mindless, because I think a lot of what we do is is mindless stuff. Yeah, and there's a place for mindlessness or for not judging ourselves too harshly about it if we do it a little bit of the time and not too much. And I would argue that for many, this is very difficult to even go 15 minutes um, at the beginning because from the data that I talked about earlier about unlocking phones, people are already checking in every 10 or 15 minutes. And so when you start asking them to not check in for 15 minutes, what it does is it increases their anxiety. So they have to fight through that increase. And, that, and it didn't, we didn't get to this place quickly. We got here very slowly. The, the smartphone is, is basically 10 years old. We didn't all of a sudden jump into using our smartphone every 15 minutes or less. It slowly crept up on us. And we have to be a little bit more gentle with ourselves and realize that we have to slowly creep back out a little. 
And I think that's why I like this technique. I call it tech breaks, where you let the, the timer on your phone, let an alarm tell you when to check in rather than letting your biochemistry making you check in. I also think many people may find it helpful or encouraging, you know, that you've said it may become harder before it gets easier. You know, the fact that it may feel extremely hard to go 15 minutes uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it will stay that hard forever. Right. And and you remember um, the marshmallow test that was done back in the 60s where they brought little kids in and they would put a marshmallow on a plate and tell the kids that if they could that if they could just wait and hold off for, for it depends on the, the study, but three minutes, five minutes, whatever, that the experimenter would give them two marshmallows to eat. And what they found was that people that most of the kids could not delay the gratification. They would just eat that marshmallow. Um, although there's a cute video of a kid taking a little bite off the bottom of the marshmallow and then putting it back on the plate so nobody <laughs> could see it. Um, but I think that we're in this kind of marshmallow test right now. And there's actually some research I just, just picked up today that I haven't had a chance to read where somebody basically simulated the marshmallow test with the phone there and not letting, not letting people pick up their phone saying, if you don't use your phone for the next X number of minutes, here's, here's what you will get. So you get some sort of reward. And my first reading of it was it turned out to be very difficult for them to not do it to delay gratification. So part of what we're, we're going to have to relearn is to be adult about this and to learn that we don't have to get the gratifications that come from our phone immediately, that we can delay them. They're still there. They're not going away. And maybe then we can be more focused, have a better attention, um, tend to our spouse better. We see a lot of, a lot of people talking about how um, the spouse is always on the phone. They can't talk. They don't have communication anymore. Um, and that often happens, by the way, when spouses are watching television together at night, because nobody watches television solitary anymore. There's always a second screen involved. Um, it's pretty amazing that you can't. we can no longer sit and stare at the television and gain information from whatever we're watching without having something to back us up. Um, I, I find that fascinating. I'm thinking about your marshmallow test analogy. I wonder if we can right here launch a smartphone marshmallow test challenge. <laughs> Let people sit with their phone in front of them and, I don't know, record themselves on video to see who can go the longest before turning it over. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that the teenager, not teenagers, the young adults um, develop this game called the cell phone stack. I don't know if you've heard of this, but yes. Um, when they go out to dinner, they all put their cell phones in the middle of the table, and the first one who can't stand it and has to check their phone has to pay the entire bill. So that is a, essentially a marshmallow test. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I mean, what we're talking about with that in part is the fact that it can be helpful to uh, bring some social pressure or social support, whichever way you want to look at it, into helping us adapt our interactions with technology. It's not always something we have to do alone or is even best to try to work on just alone. Right. And it does fit into another strategy that I'm, I talk to parents a lot about is to create in your world what I would call technology-free zones. Um, the most important one, I think, is at the dinner table. Um, because this is a captive time. You, you've got your kids there. It's a perfect time to talk to your kids, to find out what they're doing, how their life is going. Or if you don't have kids, it's a good time to talk to your spouse. And so I urge people to make their dinner table a technology-free zone. And if people can't stand it, then throw in a tech break in the middle of dinner. Let everybody go get their phone and look at it for two minutes. But it still remains a technology-free zone. And then if you think about it, the television area can be one. If you want to stop people from second screening, the car, when people are in the car, instead of playing with their phone the whole time, you can talk, God forbid. Um, so I think that if you couple all these things together, you can end up feeling healthier. And when you're healthier mentally and emotionally, you're going to be more productive. And I, and I don't mean productive in work as much as I mean productive in life. The relationships will be better. 
Um, your work will be better. Your sleep will be better. Everything will improve. Well, that's a really good, positive, motivating note to end on. So thanks so much, Dr. Larry Rosen, for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. You're very welcome. It was fun talking to you. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Dr. Larry Rosen, professor of psychology, expert in the psychology of technology, and the author of five leading books on technology and psychology. If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes. And check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Ananda Leek, a meditation and yoga teacher who helps people and organizations to outsmart stress with wellness, tap into creativity, and have a healthy relationship with technology.